This morning we are using a text from one of the Psalms of David, and I suspect it has not been interpreted very often as we wish to approach it, because very often these very old ideas have some eternal truths behind them. The uh, idea in this particular verse is that David sings that the earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof. Now this does something we had not really given much attention to, but it's tremendously true. What David is telling us is that God is a landlord. Now we've accused him of many things, but not that generally. <laughs> But it is true. The only owner there is anywhere in the material universe is the creating power itself. It is the deity that becomes, in a sense, the source of all of the labors of peoples. Now, if uh, God is the landlord, then humanity, made up of all races and nations, are all tenants. Now, we know down here in our little human community that there are many difficulties between landlords and tenants. They don't get along too well together. The tendency, of course, of the landlord is to resent the fact that the tenant lets his property go to pieces. Well, God might have the same feeling concerning our use of this wonderful world that was given to us. We're not taking proper care of it. We're not good tenants. We just do as we please, and when it gets impossible, we try to move out. On the other hand, the tenant has certain grudges and grievances. He likes to believe that he is being imposed upon now, whenever he asks anything, it's not given to him, or if it is, it's done grudgingly. And uh, there is really very little understanding between the two great groups. The first group consisting of one only, God, and the second group consisting of everyone else. Now, the actual truth of the matter is that no matter how we look at it, we are all tenants. There is not anything in this world that the human being can actually own. Now we have nations that are fighting for the fatherland. We have one country trying to take over the territories of another. We find all kinds of exploitations going on around us in the world, even in our own communities. But behind it all is an inevitable fact that we do not own anything. We can have things. We buy them from some local real estate agent who is selling us something he doesn't own. And if we go back far enough to the original deed, it goes back to heaven. Actually, only thing that any of us can have is a lease, a lend lease on the things that to us are important. We can borrow a good home and live in it for a lifetime, but we cannot own it permanently because we have to leave it. So it goes to someone else. All we have actually bought is a lease for a lifetime, and that is all we buy on anything in this world. Now we try to extend this lease a little by deeding the things to our descendants. This is only, however, putting off the, the matter temporarily. They are in the same condition. And all over the world, families are dying out completely, and the properties go to strangers. We have all kinds of things we enjoy in this world. We enjoy great art. There's been quite a deal in the papers recently of some very expensive art. Then we find that these wealthy people create museums and deed the art to the public. This is all they can do with it anyway, because actually no one can own anything except for his own lifetime. And this is usually not too long a span, 
because the larger donors do not reach that the ability to don until they're well and long in middle life. So here we are in a world in which we are becoming increasingly selfish. We are constantly striving to take over something. Pitcairn Island, with uh, less than 200 inhabitants, has an idea that it would like to be a free and independent nation. A Vatican City, with measuring only in acreage, is a municipal entity. And then something else that owns half the world, like China, believes it is here forever. But whether China is half the planet, or how old it is, planet, uh, the planet is not Chinese. The whole deal must ultimately return to the big landlord. Now, the big landlord is uh, um, equipped with certain rules. He is perfectly willing to permit tenancy with reasonable restrictions. These reasonable restrictions do not permit vandalism. They do not permit or advocate the exhaustion of natural resources, nor do they support the concept of waste. Actually, everything that is on this planet is to us by loan. Our natural resources belong ultimately to the Lord and the remains and revenues thereof. But we don't think about this very much. Everything we can get our hands on is for us. Now, this great sense of possession leads us to wonder what we can possess. We can't possess the trees or the earth or the sky. We can't possess the air. We can pollute it, but we can't possess it. We can do all kinds of unpleasant things to detract from the beauty, joy, and healthfulness of our environment. But we cannot own the environment. We can only use it or misuse it. And in the world today, environments are mostly, environments are mostly misused. As we think all these matters over, it would seem that one of the great foundations of our problems is this desperate desire to accumulate. We want more than the neighbor. We want enough to protect ourselves and our descendants. We have all kinds of ideas of how we can own things. And instead of recognizing that this ownership is at most only the position of custodian. We get too much involved in the ideas of profit, uh, which is itself a fallacy, and get away from the natural integrities by which this planet could be well regulated and those dwelling together could enjoy the privileges and benefits of a very benevolent and very understanding a landlord. Now we have this given to us, this world in which we live, in order that we may grow, increase in grace, become a, a more aware of the wonders of nature. We want to enjoy the privileges of learning, and out of it all we want to grow. And the great byproduct of life is growth. And where growth doesn't occur, life is wasted. So this great environment that has been given to us, this wonderful world which is on lease to us, is actually the great sphere of environmental growth. The only thing we can take with us when we leave is the experience that we have gained. It's exactly like a child going to school. When he graduates from school, he cannot take the school with him, but he takes with him what he has learned in the school. When we depart from this world, we cannot take the, the worldliness with us. We cannot take the things we own. The Chinese tried to bury the images of their kings and emperors and their whole courts of the earth, so that in the afterlife, the great ones could enjoy the company 
of the things of the, of the physical life that they had enjoyed. Actually, however, we know that this was simply a gesture, that the, uh, the clay and porcelain and ivory and jade figures did not live or come to life to serve the deceased monarchs. Therefore, actually, we could simplify life tremendously if we got out of our heads some of the mistaken ideas that have been troubling us for so very long a time. We could get out of the uh, mistaken notion that wealth is something that is permanent and that a wealthy person is one who has actually control over the destiny of his possessions. This is not true. He can will them as he wants to, and half the time the will will be broken. He can do all he wishes to do. He can even ask to have his worldly goods buried with him. But if he does, he might merely put it in a casket where it remains until it rots away or is discovered by someone else who then gains possession for a time. The idea of permanent possession, permanent estate, and the glories of mortal life, all these ideas are fallacies. We are not here to increase in the worldly aspects or to uh, find ways of becoming leaders over other people. What we are trying desperately to do, if we know it or not, is we are trying to learn how to live. We are trying to learn how to mingle together in a companionship of ethics. We are here to serve with each other and to make the marvelous discoveries of the latent potentials locked in those around us. Therefore, actually, this is merely a classroom at best. It is a place which is used to study in. But most people aren't studying in it anymore. They are not much interested in study. What they really want now is to change this earth into a playground. They want to make it one vast enjoyment. But somehow, they don't seem to work it quite that way. Instead of being happier every day, they are more fear-ridden every day. And these fears and anxieties are gentle reminders from the big land landlord that we are abusing our properties. We are not doing what we should be doing. If we were, there would be no worry, no fear, and very little debt. It is because we are irra irrational in our methods of doing things that we forget entirely the ethics of existence and the morality of relationships and go on trying to make our little pile somewhere to gain that extra money that will give us the yacht and the uh, summer home in the islands. And yet the next year when we go, that home will pass to someone else. And unless we are very fortunate, we may have to sell the yacht before we die. All of this is dealing in transient, inconsequential things. Almost all of our possessiveness comes under the general habit hab, of the, the general statement of the bad habit. Possessiveness is a bad habit. It is an attitude towards things that is unhealthy. It is the source of most crime. It is the source of most poverty. And the, in, un, the unequal distribution of values has got the whole world perturbed at the present time. We do not know what to do next. We do not know how to cope with the gradual exhaustion of natural resources. We do not know how to settle the endless feuds between countries. And we do not know how to arbitrate the gangsterism in our own country. All of these things are because of a basic fallacy upon which we have built since the beginning of history. We have always been desirous of conquering something. We want to rise competitively upon, above our associates. We want to have more than the next person. There's been no question about what to do with what we have. And very often after we get it, it's nothing but a misery. But the great adventure is to get it. And in doing this, we are unbalancing the whole economy of nature because there's no way actually for the earth to produce 
the final world conqueror. The only great conquest possible is the individual conquering himself. Many, many dictators have arisen trying to capture the earth. All they finally got was six square feet of it. They have no way of overcoming or balancing the inevitable laws of life. Even if we extend living for another 10 or 15 years, in the end, the property returns to the original owner, and there's nothing we can do to prevent it. And if we try to will it to somebody else, it merely puts off the evil time. But when they pass, they must do the same, and ultimately, it will return to nature itself. But it may return very tired, badly exploited. It may not be the beautiful earth they started out with, but a crumbling planet being destroyed by the ruthlessness of human beings themselves. Actually, we have to try to reconstruct life. One thing that was pointed out, I think, by the uh, 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 philosophers of the Elizabethan period in England, uh, that was pointed out very clearly that the, the values that are interesting, important, significant, useful, are not competitive that there is nothing in all the world that we need to cheat each other about. Actually, the proper integrity would result in all persons having their proper place in a simple, natural, and direct plan of existence. It is not necessary for poverty to exist, but poverty must exist while competition exists. There is no reason why an autocracy or a dictatorship should plague civilization. A dictator is only someone belie who believes he can run the world, when in reality, even as he believes this, he is fading away himself. So in this idea of the world belonging to the original landlord, I think we have the grounds for considerable reflection. We can begin to estimate what we can do to restore the property. When we sign the lease, symbolically, we agree to return the property to the original owner in good condition. We agree to take care of keeping it clean. We are willing to make such necessary repairs as have been caused by our own tenancy. Therefore, actually, the idea is that the original owner is entitled to receive back the property in, his, in the same quality of condition that he leased it in the first place. Well, if anyone should reply, return the planet at this moment to the original landlord, it would be a very terrible misery. It would be necessary to completely reconstruct, reorganize, re-edit, and renovate the shattered fabric that comes back. We are ruining the planet even though we do not own it. We are ruining somebody else's property. We are damaging natural resources that can affect generations as yet unborn. And we keep right on doing it. We have no intentions of interfering with business as usual. And when this business becomes impossible and we gather unto ourselves a depression, then we all feel that the landlord is to blame. Things have not worked out and, of course, we could never be wrong. As atheism increased and became more prevalent in this country and in the world, the idea of the big landlord sort of faded out entirely, and it was finally decided that, that the planet was a small island in space in which a large number of living things were marooned together in a hopeless situation. There was nothing to look forward to except trying to do the best we could with this small ball on which we live. Atheism gave no superior factors to, uh, to strengthen us. There were no inducements to improvement because as far as atheism was concerned, the planet and all that it inhabits will fade to nothing in due time. So having no future, the materialist tries to compensate by a reckless present behavior. He will live it all up now, because now is the only time. But actually, living it up now 
is the greatest waste of time that there is. We have much more important considerations. Now as we look over the world affairs as they seem to be at the moment, we realize a gradually increasing realization that things are wrong. We are beginning to realize also that these mistakes are not divine injustices. It is not heaven that has decreed that we have a depression. It is not the divine powers of space that send one nation after another in war. These things are our own misconducts. They are the things that we do that we shouldn't do. And somewhere along the line, the answer to the whole problem is to reorganize our own concepts toward reality. Because if we continue the reckless wasting of our resources, we could end up a dead planet incapable of sustaining life. If that is the case, the big landlord would probably have to tear it down and build a new one. His apartments and uh, condominiums cannot be repaired. So we have to either begin to think seriously about living better, or we are gradually going to frustrate the entire purpose for planetary existence. We can look back and see how great civilizations of the past have disappeared and left not a rack behind. We realize it is not difficult for a civilization to die. All it has to do is continue in evil ways until there is no remedy possible. Now in this particular instance, there seems to be a very good chance that we can break the rules and that we can accomplish this renovation that is so desperately necessary. The big stumbling block is at the moment is the problem of how uh, to make this renovation without interfering with our present attitudes in any major way. In other words, we mustn't interfere with the idea of wealth. We mustn't interfere with the idea of competition. We must do all these changes without interfering with the causes of the trouble. Because these causes we have been accustomed to. It's amazing to realize that one of the biggest adjustments that humanity has made up to the present time is to become accustomed to misery. Because it is everywhere. And we have to become accustomed to broken homes, uh, to disloyal children, to corrupt governments, to natural disasters crime. These things we have to become accustomed to. They're here, and in some mysterious way, we fear that anything will change these basic patterns. Because each little person has a conspiracy of his own that depends for its fulfillment upon some mistaken activity. He is trying to accomplish a good end by bad means. And this just simply does not work. So in finding the uh, problem as it is, we have to say we cannot change the destiny of the world unless we overcome, at least in part, the difficulties which cause the problem. Other creatures outside of the human family are not decision makers in this great program. Nature itself runs according to its own rules. It is human nature that endowed with individual consciousness becomes capable of making significant mistakes. Therefore, the remedy has to rest with humanity and not the other lesser forms of life on the planet. The other forms of life are suffering also from our mistakes. What are we going to do about this? We know that we cannot go on to developing a munition industry that must ultimately cause somebody to cause a great disaster. We cannot com permit this continual emphasis upon armament, this continual determination not to let anybody else have much, this often overworked determination to take over somebody else's land. It's just like a person deciding to move into a, a, an apartment occupied by another family. They don't ask, they just move in. Now, the landlord isn't responsible for this, and the landlord doesn't like it. 
and therefore these false moves always end in trouble. When we exploit Nietzsche's privileges, when we break Nietzsche's moral and ethical rules, we always get into trouble. We have been breaking them systematically since the beginning of history, and history is now becoming a long record of the consequences of intentional errors. Now, there are a lot of things that people do that they do not realize to be wrong. But most of the major mistakes are recognized as mistakes before they're made. We know they are wrong, but they may be profitable. They may be justified by attitudes. They may be the next step in the development of a selfish system. So we condone all kinds of uh, troubles simply because we hope in the end uh, something will happen advantageous to ourselves. In the end, it doesn't happen, however. So here we are in this uh, apartment house where we have good living conditions and uh, where we have every opportunity uh, to do the things that are necessary. And the only answer, as the Chinese pointed out a long time ago, but were not able to make it work for themselves, the only thing that we can do that is permanent is to put our own houses in order, to put our own apartment in order, and prove conclusively to the landlord that we are taking proper care of his property. There is a reward for that. It's very possible the landlord will lower the rent because he doesn't have to spend so much taking care of the damage that we cause. And the universe is like this. So we have to now begin to think of what we would do in order to get the big landlord into a better condition and a better shape and kind of mind, to make him the real uh, parent, the, the lord in the castle on the top of the hill, surrounded by happy people doing the things they want to do and growing under a benevolent system of universal laws. This is what has to happen. One of the things, of course, we have to... Uh, understand some way is that there are such rules that this landlord is a real existence. It isn't an elderly gentleman with, who sits behind a desk in a bank or something. It is, however, a principle which we can personify. The great landlord, therefore, is actually integrity itself, the final cause of creation and the final means of its preservation. There are certain rules that cannot be broken, and individuals trying to break these rules are always in trouble. Up to, oh, maybe 50 or 100 years ago, people were more careful about breaking rules, especially in this country. Uh, we had a comparatively civil civilization here. We had a condition in which most people, living in smaller communities, lived according to some moral or ethical code. They were churchgoers, they were friendly, they stepped in when troubles arose, they took care of sickness and difficulty in the community, and they lived a kind of quiet life. This was now considered much too boring. We've got to have something more exciting. We can't be just people anymore. But in the course of getting all this excitement worked up, we have gradually created an impossible burden we have created a situation in which our very joys are destroying us, that we are no longer able to withstand the pressures of our own appetites. A good example of this, of course, is the present narcotic problem. There's hardly anyone who becomes involved in narcotics who doesn't know he's in trouble, or that ultimately will destroy him. But he is no longer concerned about this. It's how he feels this minute and how he fits into the peer group today. The future is beyond comprehension or beyond interest. We are all living in deadly moments. Now this business of living only in the year of 1986 is wrong. We don't live just in one town, one time, one place. We all have a past behind us and a future ahead of us, and both are being constantly modified. The individual who believes that if he is happy today, this is all that is important. 
wakes up tomorrow in misery. The individual who believes that now is the only time worth living in is unable to change the fa values of national reorganizations of countries or corporations of cities and towns or regulations of traffic. Everything is according to the will of the moment. And this is true particularly in the matter of wealth. We are wealthy-minded. We do not care what much what happens if we lose it, but we must get it. Oh, that sounds fine in the getting, but it sounds bad in the losing. And this is what happens all the time. All the way back to the time of Plato and Aristotle, the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Hindus, uh, the wise people realized that an abuse of privilege is the source of most downfalls in history and in personal living. We do not do the best we can with what we have. Now comes a new report. We're having very great trouble maintaining literacy in our own country. People do not even care whether they can read or write they find that uh, it doesn't fit into the pattern so well. What they want is not to read and write or to study for a craft or art. What they want is a way of doing exactly what they please right now. Now this isn't universally true. There are many fine students in this country. There are many fine people. But there is this tremendous wave of people who are interested only in living up the fullness of their own appetites, whatever these may be. And anything that curtails them is a, an abuse and a crime and we necessary as cause for terrorism or civil war or anarchy. So we now have to try to think this through for ourselves, to try to see what we can do now to make it a little better. So we have to take each individual and tell him to look into his own portfolio and see what he has. What is he doing with what, is he, what he has? Is he using it? Is he wasting it? Is he able to d direct the course of his own assets in a manner a co a consistent with natural good? Is he so uh, wise and accumulating that he has a great deal, but so unwise in the distribution of what he has that he doesn't know what to do next? All the way along, we note that uh, so-called security from a physical standpoint is an illusion. There is no security uh, be, uh, beyond that which integrity and intelligence and uh, thoughtfulness can bestow upon the individual. Now we have had uh, the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Hindus also came to the conclusion that actually the only important political change that the average person can make is within himself. He has to decide what is right. He has to do that which he knows is next. Now the uh, accomplishment of right is not as difficult as it sounds. Very few people are really punished these days uh, for being well dispositioned or thoughtful or kindly. They are regarded with a certain amount of sympathy, tolerance, and even friendliness. But the average person does not want to become like them because it means that he will have to sacrifice, he will have to share, he will have to work with other people, and he will have to serve causes beyond himself. The beginning of a wise civilization is when people begin to serve causes above themselves where they start doing things for the greater good rather than merely for their own personal advantage. We have to look very carefully, as the old alchemist did, at this little bottle that we are living on. It is a kind of an alchemical bottle, and it has all kinds of things in it. But there is nothing in it that can replenish itself as rapidly as we can destroy the supply. It takes many, many years uh, to many centuries, in fact, to make changes in the great chemical structure of the earth. But it only takes a very short time for man to use up the available potentials. 
we are no we know that we have to change a great many ways because we can't live with ourselves now we are finding that wrongness bad living thoughtlessness cruelty all these are contributing to pollution and now uh, pollution is the nothing but neglect of integrities pollution is I don't care what happens I want mine now Pollution is let's forget everything else but progress. And we now really consider pollution a symptom of progress. We think if we have enough uh, progress, it will cure its own solutions and its own causes, but it won't. So we now believe that the only way to live is to continue to make the old mistakes until finally the cataclysm hits. In the last 10 years, this has lost a lot of its attractiveness. We are no longer so happy at that prospect. We are no longer so eager to see ourselves move into the ultimate state of our present condition. So all over the world, here, everywhere else, voices are being raised. Groups of people are rising against war. Others are rising against tyrannies of all kinds. They are rising against corruption in government, in law, in medicine in everything what they are really rising against or trying to is self-centeredness they are trying to rise above the self-centered ambitions of certain small groups minority groups of the people they can do it but it means that they have to start in disciplining their own integrities the uh, final answer to this particular subject addressed strictly in the terms of Lord Bacon namely that it begins by the public the people themselves demanding an improvement in world conditions it comes because each quiet citizen is beginning to realize that the civilization he has belonged to is eroding under his feet he is beginning to realize that he is on a toboggan that is leading to chaos this is beginning to filter through to all levels of people we had great ad, uh, ad admiration for science and many people do respect, respect it now but we had a tremendous respect for it when it began to give us the necessary vaccines against infantile paralysis or to help us uh, with the curing of rabies and things of this nature we also found out that it gave us electric lights and it gave us all kinds of conveniences and it has gone on and on and on until it has given us the ultimate inconvenience and that is the computer <laughs> the uh, uh, we are now in this type of situation that we really admired science we began to really regard the scientist as an adequate substitute for the priest of antiquity the scientist was the new philosopher, the new mystic, the new evangel of all things good and desirable. Then all of a sudden, this great scientist, scientific world, gave us the bomb. In that one moment, our faith in progress on a material nature received a death wound. We found that the greater skill we have adds to our misery unless we can control our own skill and we haven't been able to do so so here we are deprived of the leadership of that phase of knowledge which promised to lift us into infinite happiness peace and security we now know that it is leading us towards an incredible disaster but having lost the, the face of scientific progress we began to look around a little bit for philosophical progress and we found that we didn't have much luck if we wanted any philosophy worthwhile we had to drop back several hundred years to a more golden age of thinking when the individual had the leisure and the incentives to analyze his own life and the life of the society to which he belonged modern philosophy has been very sterile and unproductive in its contributions to life then we turn to religion here we find solid religions that have stood all over the world for centuries 
and they have unquestionably been the greatest single cause of good that we have had in society. But they also have had their limitations. They have been unable to reach the core of the disaster, and that is the nature of the believer himself. We have all kinds of religions that say, thou shalt not kill. And we have killing in every color, race, and belief there is. We are told to love one another and go to church to believe this and then turn around and exploit one another. We are talking about religion, but we're not living it. We are talking about integrities and we honor the saints long dead who had them, but we are not doing it ourselves. We do not believe that when we read in the scripture, thou shalt love one another, that this is intended for us. Why should we love anybody? And yet we consider ourselves religious people. We also have our allegiances in other areas. In every area, however, we have theories that are good, we have concepts that are useful, and practices that are not. So we now have to face the very simple problem of changing this particular problem and realizing truly that the voice of the people is the voice of God. And the voice of the people is a more or less of a whimper at the moment in most parts of the world. Most people are sending up cries and wails of sorrow, misery, and pain. And this in itself must have a very deep effect upon the laws of nature because there isn't a single law in nature that was created to cause hate. There isn't a single law in nature that was intended to dom demonstrate the importance of dishonesty. All of these corruptions have arisen within people who have disobeyed the law, distorted them, falsely interpreted them, or ignored them completely. So the time is now, and we see in the last five or ten years, a tremendous upsurge. There is an upsurge in religion, but it is not limited entirely to the traditional forms. For these traditional forms are very largely involved in the very mistakes that they are supposed to be healing. The, the religions themselves have to have a more or less definite renovation. They have to get back to the principles upon which they were built, and they must divide peoples into two groups a religious person who keeps the rules and a member of something who simply breaks them. This difference is becoming very vital and important. So with the proper understanding of a new idea of what constitutes a spiritual integrity, we can have considerable progress. Now it has been a notable phenomenon for thousands of years uh, that religions have been strongly re renovated in times of great emergency. And while people drifted along very largely doing as they pleased, religions were a luxury. But when things get really bad, religion becomes a necessity. And in this particular case, it is coming that way at the moment. Also, the individual looking around him has great difficulty in finding a religion that actually satisfies him. Now this is not as real a problem as it seems to be because he is judging the religion by the followers, not by the principles of the faith itself. These are sound. They are real and they are recognizable and they are realistic. But in the course of constant renovations and revolutions and definite reformations, the integrities of many cases vanished from uh, view. They are there, but we do not notice them. But people looking for a religion see the mistakes of the various faiths and assume these mistakes are the realities. Therefore, they turn from a religion which has been destroyed by their own kind and not by the weakness of its own internal structure. Most religions can be useful if they are developed with integrity and honesty. But where they become bound into sectarian debates where they become the basis of conflict and discord, then religions do the very thing they were supposed to prevent, and that is to contribute to the sufferings of mankind. So religion is important to us. 
And now we begin to see a new dimension of religion. And in some cases it looks rather good, and in other cases it's a little bit uh, disturbing. And on the one side is people looking for religion inside themselves and creating their own concepts of religion. That the individual has decided to try and create a religion for himself. Now this is quite an interesting job for a person who really has no training in this. And each person trying to create a religion new, suitable to his own needs gets into complications. He doesn't really know what he's doing. But in the course of years, these people who do not know what they're doing really sometimes become quite popular and had a considerable following and spread the uncertainties among their associates. Now, this doesn't mean that these people are bad or wrong or anything, but it means that you not only have to have a good religion, but you have to have in yourself the ability to judge it, to find out whether it is good or not, and to divide the wheat from the chaff in this, uh, in this field also. To be a successful member of a living faith, you must understand that faith, and you must understand the demands that it makes upon you. A faith that promises everything and demands nothing is not really suitable to the needs of the moment. It never was. If we have a religion which does not demand improvement, that is a religion that is largely a panacea based upon some trivial interpretation, then it is not going to do the job that is needed today. Religion today has to strengthen the real meanings of faith, love, compassion, and integrity. Now to do this, it also must have some way of reaching into the life of the individual and causing him to believe that there is something better that he can learn and can practice. Well, there are all kinds of things that need doing, and it's almost impossible to have a good thought without being able to use it constructively. But above everything else, there are certain major factors of belief, and these factors of belief are still tarnished by the name of religion when in reality they are the basis of integrities. As Lord Bacon so well uh, mentioned in one of his essays, that it was better uh, to uh, believe all the absurdities that have been distributed in various creeds and cults than it is to deny that this universal fabric has a mind, that this universal fabric is itself an entity that it is something that has nature, has will, has power, has force, has value, and the individual has to discover what it is. So each person in this confused time is becoming aware of the desperate need for religious convictions that are strong enough to take over the dominant leadership of the personality. An individual's religion must be big enough so that he can believe it himself that he cannot be talked out of it by ordinary circumstances or misinformed associates. Religion must now take its own place. And of, of religion today, the most appropriate and most powerful is mysticism. Mysticism is basically a process of transferring religious leadership from a sect, a creed, or a prophet to the inside of the person himself. A mystic is an individual whose religion is seated in his own soul, that it is justified by his own soul, that it is sustained by his own mind, and is made more important and potent by his own feelings, and is finally demonstrated by his own actions. Religion, therefore, is now coming in as a search for consolation of spirit. It is seeking to give the strength to understand why the individual must pass through the emergencies with which most are afflicted. But more than that, this has within it a, another factor. When a person finds a deep faith within himself, which helps him to stand against the false pressures of his day, he feels an almost inevitable impulse to tell other people about it. He wants them to know also. But here you come into trouble because most people are not able to communicate correctly. In fact, the greatest mystics of all times 
have been unable to communicate mysticism. Vaini couldn't do it, Plotinus couldn't do it, and in very large measure Jesus couldn't do it. The actual mystical experience cannot be described, cannot be transformed or transferred into some articulate structure by which it can be easily demonstrated. The final mysticism of religion is completely internal, but the need for it, spreading through society, is like planting seeds in a large field. The need for this consolation, falling into each human soul, will, with reasonable care and thought, help that soul to grow and help to produce from within that soul the solution to its own problems, solutions that will stand not only the test of time, but the test of eternity. Now, there are many ways in which we should face these situations in order to try uh, to help not only our world, but our own immediate environment. Looking around us, we know definitely that we are an impermanent creation moving through time and space, that we are here today and gone tomorrow. But when we are gone, we are not gone forever. The end of material existence is not to be summarized by the, as by the atheist who says there is nothing, or by some theologians who believe the hellfire and damnation beliefs. Somewhere in the thing, it must be found by the individual that death is merely a day in school, a step from one grade to another, a motion from one level to another, and that in the long analysis of things, many deaths and lives and must come in order for the individual to consolidate one character within himself. The power within the individual by which the body should be governed, does not die with it. The power within the individual by means of which he can lead himself and those around him into a sharing of, in, of, in, of in, un, uh, inspirations and understandings. These powers go on, they live on, they do not die with the person. They are part of an eternal heritage. Also, we each are, has a growth. We have a growth in which we are growing up inside. Now, some people find it easier uh, to live well than others. Some have more temptations to stress and pain than others have. This means, of course, difference in the background of the soul life itself. It means that the individual has had experiences which are not completely shared by those around him. But the fact remains that we are here to enrich that which survives. The only thing worth working with is that which does not die. And the only thing that does not die in man or in the universe is life. Life itself does not die. Forms and shadows and appearances come and go. But the great stream of life to which we all belong is immortal. It goes on forever. But in the course of going on, it presents a series of challenges. The individual must find ways to experience the true meaning of life. He must learn to have within his own flesh a positive certainty concerning life. It is not something that he can read out of a book. It is not something a neighbor can convert him to or a theology convert him to. It is the inward justification of a code of ethics because of an interior ex example within the self, because of an interior experience, a vital recognition and realization of the integrity of existence. This is important. This is necessary. No one can give it to us. But conditions can demand it. The present situation we're in, for the first time, in the development of modern civilization has proven to us beyond all doubt that civilization as we know it is not enough. The material advancement of mankind is not the solution, either of his spiritual destiny or, for that matter, of his material continuance. The individual now can and must begin to look toward the integrities of life. 
He must weigh his own thoughts. He must consider his own teachings and those that have been given to him. He can draw upon his education. He can draw upon the wisdom of the past and the hopes of the future. But he must, in his own way, find inside of himself an irresistible determination to grow. And he gets it only when he realizes that the alternative is too terrible to contemplate. If he doesn't grow, the great misfortunes will continue to gather and, and paralyze him. He must grow. He must use the facilities of life. He has been placed in this world as in a condition in which he has everything necessary to learn. He has all knowledge available to life. He has the entire structure of the universe to help him. He has the intuitive and spiritual and soul powers within himself to help him. He has every hope and every reason to know that he can grow from within himself, that he can become a good and faithful tenant or a good and faithful servant in the house of his God. He can do it by his own gradual recognitions. He can learn to just read across the headings of a newspaper and find why he should change his own conduct. He can find everywhere the eternal sorrows resulting from compromise and from breaking away from the integrities of life. So in these conditions and for these reasons, there is every hope that this is going to be the great turning point in civilization. We have had all kinds of things. In the beginning with war, we threw stones at each other. Uh, then we used a, st a stone axe. Finally, we developed a bow and arrow, then a spear, and then a lance thrower. We developed all kinds of situations, finally making a rude cannon out of wood bound with metal. We invented firearms. We did all these different things. We improved all the implements of war up to the present time, where we have had almost every conceivable way of destroying each other. And we have used all of them with great enthusiasm. And every war, nearly, was one to bring peace to the world. And each one made it worse. Now, with, we have over thousands of wars behind us, there is no reason why an individual who is not feeble-minded to believe that they're going to solve anything. And now he gets a new point. In the days of the bow and arrow, uh, it wasn't so bad. You could dodge behind a tree and probably not get hit. In India, they had the answer to one phase of it. When the armies decided to meet in battle, uh, it was necessary to go to the head man of a community or something and say, we want to have a war and we want to have it on a piece of land that is so bad nothing else will grow on it. We don't want to interfere with the crops because Victor and Loser must both eat. We do not want to endanger the innocent. So if you can show us where there's a nice quiet desert where nobody cares, there we'll have our war. Now that at least was military efficiency. <laughs> it's probably one of the best ideas they had. And there are accounts in Indian literature of farmers plowing the field with their oxen, paying no attention to a clash of arms uh, maybe a couple of hundred yards away. The war was on the bad part of the ground, and the farmer never bothered to stop sowing and reaping just because there was a war next door to him. And the, the warriors in the war would not think of disturbing him because they all had to eat. Well, we haven't even reached the point now where we realize the importance of peace as a source of food. We always figure we are going to capture enough of the enemy's supplies to keep our own stomachs full for a little while. But now it's all different. The ground will not bring forth a crop. All the things we are doing are becoming more and more insane. So. We are confronted now with a simple, very simple fact that the average person must see this. And it's getting to the point where nearly everyone does see it. And when they all see it, or most of them see it, or a good many of them see it, there's going to be changes produced by the recognition of the urgency of the need for change.
We are going to not do the things that we know will cause destruction. We will curb our ambitions and our appetites and find, a, find ways by which we can survive. And it looks as though we're right on the verge of this ch change, which has been referred to in some cases as a new world order, a new approach to life a great way of existence based largely on the golden rule, a, a great new dimension of existence in which leadership and all phases of administration will be handled with integrity rather than simply selfish enthusiasm. So we now feel that there is much to be gained by realizing that this crisis is probably the best thing that has ever happened to us because it is the first time when we can simply state clearly one more mistake and we are not here. Well, always there was somebody that got away before. They went into some other country. They moved into other lands. They were able to restore their civilization and escape most of the horrors following war. But now, with the nuclear weapons, there is no escape. So now, solution is necessary. And solution will be found. And it looks as though that solution is going to bring with it also a very important restatement of religion. That we're going to find that religion is, in the last analysis, is the one power that is capable of protecting the mind and the body from its own mistakes. This gradually is, is developing. All around, people are working. Some better, some not so wisely. But all more or less con uh, dedicated and devoted to preventing an ultimate disaster. If that is done, then all has been done that could be done. The whole of civilization is a success if the human being becomes civilized and civilization and the getting together and the recognition of the dangers of selfishness and cupidity, ambition, tyranny. When these things are recognized, humanity will make the greatest step forward since the beginning of its individualization. We will all grow. We will all have a new world to live in. We will have a new kind of earth because we will have learned the lesson well enough to keep the rules, which is the thing that is essential at this time. So when we start with the little problem of who runs the world, and we decide that it is run by a divine power, we also decide that regardless of what we do, we are not going to break the rules of that power. In order to evade the rules, we have to deny the power. And as we look around us, even science can no longer deny the power. We can see, learn, and know the immensity of the universe. We may not be able to understand all of its distances, and we may not be able to find out exactly what is on the other side of a black hole. But we do gain one great overthought, and that is the universe is big. We also find out as we go along that the universe is a perfectly organized structure. Every discovery of science depends for its validity upon the fact that it is supported by other previous scientific discoveries. Everything that we learn, we learn by building upon the known. And in the world of realities, if we build correctly upon the known, we take the next step forward. Therefore, there's no doubt in the world that science has demonstrated to us that there's something out there that knows how to run it, and we don't. There's something out there that we will work with for ages before we ever begin to sound the depths of these realities that go out beyond the furthest reaches of space and time. We know we are dwelling in the midst of immensity, and that this immensity is organized, that it is is fair, honest, reasonable, and intelligent. So having come to some such a conclusion as that, we now come to the point where we know enough about the facts of life 
to be able to appreciate the next steps that are necessary. We do not have to step out into the unknown with a hope that we're right. We have enough foundations now to build a concept of life that is intelligent, workable, and uh, suitable to the needs of the modern human being. We know today that we can build a religion that is irrefutable, that does not depend upon the acceptance of myths or legends, that does not depend upon a membership brought on by enthusiasm or any other consideration. A universal religion built upon a universal in, in, in intelligence and integrity is available to us. We are, for the first time in history, uh, awarded sufficient fact knowledge to be able to build world peace. We are reaching a point where there is no intelligent excuse for the mistakes that are burdening us today. They are not inevitable results of ignorance but they are, the, more or less, the consequence of the individual serving the wrong peer group. He is serving or uniting with others that do not know either, instead of working towards that which does know. So uh, Plotinus, as a Neoplatonist, almost clearly s summed up this particular situation, namely that the Enlightenment, the next coming of truth, comes in us as the result of the suffering of mistakes. Inside of each of us, there is a dawning enlargement of a realization that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And this discovery is the beginning of universal reformation. When this realization reaches enough people, there will be no more excuse for the vandalisms with which we are now afflicting ourselves. But the whole change is not going to be thrown upon us by a denomination. It is going to arise out of our own need. It is going to be the soul in us coming to comfort us in our dilemmas. It is going to be something that will educate us, not by word of book or by word of mouth, but by realization, by feelings, by experiences, the way that leads finally out of this labyrinth and toward the security of all things. I think we are very fortunate, therefore, in living right now, because maybe we've lived many times before, but we've never had a life before which was as decisional as the one we are in now. In this life, with ages of experience, preparation, thought, effort, all these things are being focused upon now the time in which it is supremely hoped that between now and the end of the century the real realities will take hold, that we will outgrow the foolishness of selfishness, that we will outgrow the vanity of power, and that we will discover the real reason for our existence. If that happens, then the human being can do the things he was supposed to do. In a nice well-ordered universe, a well-ordered human society, we have people with time. It will not be necessary to neglect children. It will not be necessary uh, to build more and bigger prisons. It will not be necessary for us uh, to compete with our neighbor for the size of the front door. These things will go, and the mind and heart will be left for the two great labors with which we should all be concerned, the labor of growing wiser and the gr labor of loving more honestly. Love and faith and truth can take over as soon as the individual discovers for certain and beyond doubt that selfishness is fatal, that there is no way in which it can be condoned, and that all of our material efforts build on the concept of building a tremendous temporal empire on our little planet. These efforts are wasted. There is nothing possible on this little planet but a nice little civilization, appropriate to the size of the planet, appropriate to the needs of the people, 
and suffer to maintain the resources of the planet. We can have a nice little world of our own and live in it, bring our children into it, work with them, overcome most of the diseases and problems of life, have a comparatively healthy career, friendly, good-natured, honest, busy, with plenty of activity and variation of enterprise and a constant enlargement of humanitarian impulses. The only thing is there will not be anywhere near the poverty that needs our humanitarianism. What will not be, what is not be used in that way will be used to advance the common good in a positive direction rather than to make abeyances or try to estimate the needs that have been created by dishonor. All these things will help. And this is why I think we have to realize, for once and for all, get out of our minds that we own the planet. We don't own the planet. We've got to get in harmony with the big landlord. We've got to decide what we're going to do in harmony with universal purpose. We are in need of becoming good and faithful workers in a common cause. We are in need more and more of vision for the lack of which the people perish. So if we can get rid of this idea that this physical world is all important, and while we watch it disintegrate, it is time to think about other things. The world is only important because if we don't have it, we keep on falling indefinitely because there will be nothing under our feet. But it is not the answer to our problem. The answer to our problem is that on this little planet, as in a little schoolhouse, we are going to learn to live together, love together, build together, work together, and cooperate for the glory of God and the good of humanity. When we get to that point, you'll be surprised. This will be a rather pleasant place. All the problems that now burden us, all the diseases which now afflict us, will gradually fade away if we stop breaking the rules. Because misery is a penalty for mistake. And many times the mistake is by without knowledge. We don't intend to make the mistake. Nature tells us that if we don't stub our toe, we'll never learn to walk better. So all the problems that come along help us if we have the right consciousness in ourselves. We can build an educational system that fits young people to live. We can build a world civilization in which older persons can have a joyous experience of the fulfillment of their years. We can have busy people doing wonderful and beautiful things. And we will have a, the big landlord finally happy and running his big institution, his great set of condominiums with peace and understanding. It all works together. We will never know, as one of the Greeks said, we will never know that there are rules unless we break them. If we keep them, everything goes along perfectly. We don't need to even know about them. But when we start to break them, it's all different. Well, we've been breaking them too long. So now it comes the time when instead of breaking them, we've got to work with them and for them for the preservation of our way of life. So we have people, we are doing it ourselves, trying to tell others little ideas to help them grow a bit more, trying to get people to realize that growth is dedication to unfoldment of integrities, that it is not something in which we can uh, gain admission by buying or by uh, investing in the ordinary sense of the word. Growth is through the constant enlargement of conscience, a greater understanding, a greater participation in the work of the world. That in the individual is no longer mindful always of himself, he will have a much better world. Also, there's no question in the world, actually, that if we can get this thing where it belongs, that the entire cycle of human life will lose most of its miseries. There is no reason why a properly balanced world, properly functioned, should be continually plagued with the pains of childbirth, the pains of, a, of sickness, the pains of age, of the miseries of transition. 
These things are all part of an imperfect way of life. If we understand properly, if we live the life, most of the sorrows of life will fade. And by keeping a few simple rules, we can greatly alter the health patterns of the whole of society. Everything depends on the fact that the human body is in itself a little empire. And when it breaks its own rules, or its rules are broken, then the body suffers. And then the, in the body structure, man himself is the big the overseer, the big landlord running his own body, which has more parts in it, perhaps, and more units of life in it than the whole planet has in creations here. Always the leader uh, has the responsibility of creating by rules, and those who follow must perpetuate by keeping those rules. And in the end, if we keep the rules of life, the rules of life will keep us. And we will find that nearly all of the miseries that we know in life are the result of not learning the facts of life and in developing a tremendous education which teaches us everything except what we need to know. Every child graduating from school should recognize and know his responsibilities to society and himself and should be find the greatest fulfillment and joy in playing his part in the improvement of human civilization. All these things will come and are nearer than they ever been before and if you look around you I think you'll see that they're very much nearer than they used to be. And if you look inside of you, I think you'll find all of you that they're nearer there, too, than they ever have been before. Oh, that's it. Thank you.